Hello, everyone. This is Troy Leach from the PCI Security Standards Council. Today, we are going to talk to you about SSL and early TLS migration. As many of you know, we are now in the first quarter of 2018, and fast approaching is the June 30th deadline. Today, we're going to talk to you about uh, the risks as well as opportunities to uh, work in, in, with your IT teams and, and business leaders to find ways to migrate away from the older protocol and what that might mean for your organization. With me today, I have Emma Sutcliffe. She is our Director of Data Standards. Uh, she has oversight of the DSS particularly, which is where this requirement comes from. And also we have on the line Ralph Spencer Poor. He is our Director of Emerging Standards and one of our cryptographic experts here at the PCI Council. So let's begin by walking through the agenda. We are going to be talking about the risks of using SSL and early TLS, as well as what the migration deadlines have been and what you should have been preparing for over the last two to three years. We'll talk about some in specific environments, such as the POI, or point of interaction environment. And we'll also talk about uh, what you can do for ASV scans and recommendations we have for strategies for securing these types of environments where you might be using the protocol to secure payment transactions. So looking at SSL and understanding specifically what it is that we're trying to accomplish, SSL was a cryptographic protocol that was originally created in 1996 uh, by Netscape. It was later standardized by the IETF, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, and as, as TLS. And as it's gone on for the last 20 years, it's gone through several revisions uh, since that time. Most people probably recognize SSL as that little gold lock associated with a e-commerce transaction or a secure connection of their browser. And what we're trying to accomplish here is looking at ways that we can maintain the integrity and trust that that gold lock first established in the 1990s for early commerce transactions and move forward to the next generation of encryption and security for uh, online as well as other uses for SSL. So what is that risk? Well, first, the, probably the biggest risk is the attack surface that exists today for the payment ecosystem. Uh, it is widely used in a majority of not only payment transactions, but also as the mechanism to securely pass uh, credentials and other uh, authentication and authorization information through the internet uh, to other trusted parties. It is therefore a, a great target for attack. And as of late, in the last few years, we've seen a growing number of different types of attacks, uh, Poodle being possibly the most notable, but Beast, Crime, and other vulnerabilities that have crept up. And there is importance to understand the difference in these vulnerability classes. So we have the protocol vulnerabilities, and there, there are many of these where this is actually the protocol itself is not able to um, or is exploitable now. And the challenge we have with that is there's not a patch that can fix that because it's inherent within the protocol itself. We also have implementation vulnerabilities. And this could be seen in things like the heart bleed, buffer over read, and other types of vulnerabilities um, that come because of, of different ways that you can implement um, the use of, of the algorithm and, and within the protocol. And then finally, we have configuration vulnerabilities. And these are weak cipher suites, um, incorrect key sizes. Uh, the logjam attack would be uh, that was used for export grade cryptography uh, was probably one example of a configuration vulnerability 
that can be corrected, but also is a significant risk when we're talking about securing payment transactions. And finally, we have the impact. What is, what is that result of those vulnerabilities? And the first is the loss of confidentiality and integrity. So many of these attacks can actually result in a, a man in the middle attack where uh, you may not even know that the, that the secure line has actually been compromised. We also have the ability uh, to lose cryptographic keys. So not only just the data that we're trying to protect, but actually, and this is a very serious case, vulnerabilities that allow for an attack to steal long-lived cryptographic keys that may be very difficult um, in certain configurations to replace. So we do have several recommendations. I won't spend too much time here because Ralph later in this presentation will go into more detail about what these are. But since 2015, uh, what we've been talking about is a need to migrate to TLS version 1.2, uh, to patch the existing TLS software against implementation vulnerabilities, and then also to eliminate configuration vulnerabilities in how we uh, implement securely TLS. So for us, and one of our points of emphasis has been on the online and e-commerce space. One, because these are, are card not present transactions. You're having to trust a remote uh, connection, making sure that the security, confidentiality of the information passed uh, maintains a high level of integrity, and recognize that we cannot rely on older versions of SSL and early TLS because of this. So this is a focus on browser to server host sessions. Uh, this is where many of these man-in-the-middle attacks might occur. And later in the broadcast, we're going to have Emma walk through some of the exceptions that we do create um, for this so that you recognize where the highest degree of risk is for these types of transactions and then can focus on migrating those environments first. So with that, I'll actually turn the floor over to Emma now who will walk through the SSL migration process as we've outlined over the past couple of years and what you can be doing to prepare yourself now. Emma? Thank you, Troy. Hello, everyone. Um, some of, a lot of the, the risks that Troy just walked us through, I mean, many of these risks have been known issues for quite a long time, for numbers of years, actually. But it's interesting that the push to migrate away from SSL really started to gain momentum when industry bodies like NIST uh, formally noted back in 2014 that it was no longer acceptable as a security mechanism. And, and from that point, uh, that's where the PCI DSS migration plan really started to gain momentum as well. Um, from the PCI DSS perspective, the migration requirements were first documented in version 3.1 of that standard, which came out in April of 2015. Now, after the release of that standard, we collected a lot of feedback from the PCI community about their migration efforts. Uh, we asked about challenges that organizations were facing with their migration. And some of the challenges that we heard about were related to the size and the scale of the migration efforts, the number of systems that needed to be updated. But there were also some business relationship and service provider relationship complexities that were affecting how quickly some organizations could complete their own migration. Now, as a result of all these conversations and feedback from the industry, the original migration target date was actually extended by two years to what it is today, which is June 2018. And the PCI DSS was updated to reflect these new dates um, in April of 2016, uh, which is in version 3.2 of the standard. And that is still the current version of PCI DSS, so you will see those dates reflected there today. Um, during this time uh, that's led us to where we are today, as well as updates to the standard, um, we also produce a number of uh, guidance documents and frequently asked questions to help organizations understand um, some of the complexities of migration uh, and understand how the PCDSS requirements may affect them. Um, and all of that has led us to where we are today, which is approaching the migration completion date of the 30th of June 2018. Now, looking into the, the PCDSS requirements in a little more detail, there are sort of different dates and different migration requirements that apply to different types of organizations and scenarios. 
the, the first P30 CERS migration date applied really only to processing entities and service providers, and it required that they offer a secure version of the protocol for their customers. Now, this requirement for service providers actually came into effect in June 2016, and it was intended to ensure that customers who were already using a secure version of the protocol, that they wouldn't need to fall back to insecure versions. Um, and the intent here was to ensure that the service providers had a secure version available. So even if the service provider hadn't completed their own migration yet, we still wanted to make sure that they were supporting secure versions for their customers. The next migration date is the big one. It's the upcoming one, 30th of June this year. And this one covers all types of organizations. It's not just service providers. Um, this is the date from which SSL and early TLS may no longer be used as a security control for PCI DSS. Now, what this means is that in order to meet PCI DSS requirements going forward, organizations will either need to have moved to a secure version of TLS, or they have implemented alternative security controls that prevent reliance on SSL or early TLS. Now, you may remember that at the time, and this goes back to what Troy mentioned about an allowance or an exception, we did put one in place for point of sale, point of interaction, or POI terminals. These are the, the hardened payment terminals and also the, the corresponding termination points that these terminals connect to for the purposes of, of processing payments. Now, this allowance is still in play, um, and what it means is that SSL and early TLS can still be used on those devices, on those POI devices, where those devices are confirmed to not be susceptible to known exploits. So that's just a quick overview of the different dates. Um, as the migration effort has progressed over the last few years, um, there's been some interesting topics of conversation that have, have arisen. And one of the, the big questions that, that comes up a lot is, does this mean that SSL early TLS has to be removed in its entirety in order to meet PCI DSS? The answer to this question is, well, no, not entirely. Um, SSL and early TLS are not considered strong cryptography, and what that means is they cannot be used as a security control after June 30. Uh, if SSL and early TLS are present in the environment, an alternative form of encryption would need to be in place to secure the transmission. Um, as an example, you could encrypt data at the, the packet level rather than the session level. Uh, it could run over a different type of, of session management protocol, etc. Um, but it does not mean that the existence of SSL by itself, um, it can be met, it can be addressed with compensating controls and other security measures to prevent it being relied on uh, as a security control. Another popular question that's come up over the last few years is which version of TLS is considered secure? And I'll start by saying that TLS version 1.2 is considered secure and is the recommended option from the Council's perspective. Uh, the answer becomes a little less simple when we're looking at TLS version 1.1, and this is because it is possible for implementations using TLS 1.1 to meet the requirement for strong cryptography, but it ultimately depends on the individual TLS implementation on whether it does or not. And this includes considerations like how the TLS protocol is configured, which algorithms are used and supported, uh, the types and strength of keys, etc. cetera. Um, there are a number of industry references, uh, such as NIST, that identify and describe some secure configuration options for TLS version 1.1, and we recommend that organizations who are using that version of TLS to review their implementations against these industry references to see if they do, in fact, meet that intent of strong cryptography. Another topic of discussion that's come up recently is, is how organizations should handle customer relationships where those customers are still using SSL or an old version of TLS. And our recommendation for these organizations is to incorporate a communication strategy for their customers, um, build that into your migration plan as part of your progress to the secure version of the protocol, and to help educate your customers about the dangers of using outdated browser software and the potential risks that this is actually posing to their customers' own uh, you know, data and information. Um, as another factor, many consumer browsers have already dropped support for the outdated protocols. Um, so that will also you know, help, hopefully, encourage customers to update their systems to a secure version. We've also had a number of questions around the exception for POI devices, the point of interaction devices, and whether that exception applies to all implementations of POIs. So just to confirm the scope of that allowance, um, again, it applies to the POI device itself and the termination point where they have been verified as not being uh, at risk to the known exploits. So I'll look into that in just a little bit more detail here. 
the, the reason we have the exception in the first place um, is that currently many POI terminals are not as susceptible to the same types of vulnerabilities um, and the protocol vulnerabilities as browser-based systems are vulnerable. So that's, that's the, the reason why we wanted to uh, have that allowance in place when these migration dates come out. But even so, new vulnerabilities can appear at any time. So we strongly recommend that you know every new implementation or every new device that's implemented you know is configured to use TLS 1.2 or greater where possible. And in POI environments where SSL early TLS is used, um, those POIs and their termination points must still have up-to-date patches. They must still be managed and maintained. We need to make sure that only the necessary extensions are enabled and that unnecessary services aren't running. Um, additionally, those configurations of SSL early TLS must not use weak cipher suites, and they must not use unapproved algorithms. Um, examples of those include RC4 and MD5, and those algorithms are you know, not allowed in the PCI standards, so even if SSL or early TLS is present, all of these other requirements still have to come into play. For organizations who are using POI terminals and, and want to know whether their terminal meets the requirement, um, there's a number of ways you can go about this. First of all, we, we encourage you to contact the vendor of the terminal or your support provider for that terminal because they may be able to provide you evidence or some kind of attestation or confirmation that the device is configured in a way and built in a way that it's not susceptible to those known vulnerabilities. Um, there's also you know, security professionals you may wish to engage to help you understand how your device has been configured, um, how the SSL or TLS has been implemented. Um, but do keep in mind that this verification of, of POIs not being susceptible it's going to be an ongoing process. Uh, it will need to occur you know, every time a new vulnerability is discovered to see if that vulnerability impacts that terminal. And organizations will need to keep up to date going forward uh, to identify new vulnerability trends uh, to make sure that those terminals remain not susceptible. Um, and of course, you know, as with any device from a PC ADSS perspective, uh, these POI terminals need to be managed you know, in accordance with requirements for patch management um, and managing vulnerabilities. And as new vulnerabilities evolve and come out, you know, it's also likely that in the future, a new vulnerability could be discovered that exploits POI implementations of the protocol. And in that instance, you know, merchants and their processors who are still relying on that old version will need to have a migration plan in place and ready to go because if there's no way to address that vulnerability with a patch or a fix, um, they may need to implement a migration at very, very short notice and have that uh, launched immediately. So just changing focus slightly for a minute, um, the other sort of topic that's been a, a hot conversation topic from the council perspective um, is about ASV scans. These are the external vulnerability scans performed by our, our approved scanning vendors. And the reason this has been a hot topic of conversation is that just the presence of SSL or early TLS can often generate a failure in an ASV scan. And it's not just ASV scans, um, it will also potentially generate a failure in an internal vulnerability scan as well. And the reason for this is that there are known SLC vul sorry, SSL vulnerabilities that trigger a score that's higher than medium or higher than number four on the CVSS. CVSS is Common Vulnerability Scoring System, and this is the system used by ASVs uh, to rank the severity of vulnerabilities, and this is what's reported in the scan reports. So where there's a vulnerability scan that has an identified vulnerability of a score of four or higher, these are the vulnerabilities that PCDSS requires be addressed um, and then have rescans performed to make sure that vulnerability is no longer an issue. For organizations that come across um, having an issue where the ASV scan or their vulnerability scan does trigger one of these scores of four or higher, there's a couple of ways you can look at how to address it. Prior to the migration deadline of June, you can leverage your risk mitigation and migration plan um, we have a process in place that for organizations to provide their ASV with just a, a documented confirmation uh, that they have a risk mitigation migration plan in place, that they're working through that plan, that they're working to complete their migration by the target date, and the ASV can then take that and use that in their report and document it as an exception. So that's the process to follow up until the migration deadline. Once the date of June 30 has passed, uh, organizations that do still have SSL or early TLS on their systems will need to have implemented those alternative security controls um, and they can follow processes that we have defined in the ASV program for addressing vulnerabilities with compensating controls. And in this way, the organization can confirm to the ASV 
what they have put in place to ensure the affected system is not susceptible to those identified vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, if a system isn't relying on SSL or early TLS as a security control, it's present for another reason, but they also you know, have put in the right patches and configured it the right way so that it's not susceptible to the known vulnerabilities, then that's how the, the ASV program supports the implementation of alternative controls you know, to mitigate the risk of having SSL or TLS present on those systems. Um, for organizations who are wondering about the compliance impact of having an ASC scan failure, this is where we encourage you to work with your acquiring bank and your payment brand if you report directly to a payment brand because the impacts on compliance are really determined by the individual payment brand compliance programs. Um, just from the, the ASC program perspective, one last thing I would just like to note is that the migration date uh, and these allowances that the ASC program has in place to support you know, working towards your migration date and having alternative controls, this cannot be used as an excuse to put off patching vulnerabilities or to put off or delay your migration. The ASC processes are in place to support, you know, scenarios and organizations that have implemented, you know, good, solid, defensible security um, where they have it in place on their systems to address the risk of having SSL or early TLS there. Um, these processes do not provide a means to bypass the migration requirement or to delay fixing vulnerabilities. Um, so just keep that in mind as well when you're looking at it from the results of your scan reports. And that's it uh, for me. Thank you very much. I would now like to hand over to Ralph, who's going to talk through some of the risk mitigation controls. Thank you, Emma. As Emma pointed out, there are quite a few risks associated with using SSL or early TLS. So there need to be mechanisms to mitigate those risks until such time as you're fully migrated away from that. One of the ways of mitigating the risk is to do the encryption prior to it being sent under the SSL or TLS protocol. So this could be doing the encryption at the application layer so that if the protocol is compromised, all they would see is encrypted data that couldn't be decrypted by the negotiated key from the SSL TLS session. Another thing that they can do is to reduce the attack surface by minimizing the number of places where the vulnerable protocol is used, uh, doing as much as possible to uh, keep that to those places where the ex an exception is essential uh, because it's the only thing that you, you have that works at the time. Uh, another thing that can be done there is to restrict where the vulnerable protocol can be used in terms of the endpoints, what customers, uh, or if, if possible, specific devices or known IP endpoints are involved. Uh, the tighter that this can be restricted, the better it, you have limited the impact of a, uh, an attack against the protocol. <clears throat> it's also important to do everything that you can where you're still using SSL TLS uh, in terms of restricting the configurations that are available and removing any weak cipher suites. So there are things that can help prevent uh, the downgrading, further downgrading of an SSL TLS session. Uh, and in particular, you want to make sure that it can't be uh, fall, it can't be forced to fall back to uh, an even earlier version, which would have uh, even more vulnerabilities. It's also important <clears throat> to expand <clears throat> your intrusion protection service coverage. Hopefully you are using an IPS and that through this process, <clears throat> you can expand what it covers. You can also use other anomaly activity detection systems and focus them more heavily on the kinds of activities that might indicate a failure of the vulnerable pro protocol. 
Uh, an example of that might be that uh, you are getting a large number of connect, reconnect, connect, reconnect kinds of attempts. Uh, that can be indicative of someone who is, is trying to gather enough sample data to pose a threat in, in attacking the protocol. Next, let's spend a moment or two on transition strategy. First, if your organization hasn't already, you need to complete your migration to a secure protocol. This includes working with vendors to update devices, turning off SSL TLS 1.0 fallback, and ensuring that only secure cipher suites are used. If your organization hasn't completed the transition, then a risk mitigation and migration plan is required. The RM and MP must be provided to your assessor. However, the use of an RM and MP is only valid for ROCs done prior to June 2018. That's coming up very quickly. So you'd best get on with your transition strategy. Next, I'll be talking about some of the migration planning that you need to be doing. And I think the very first thing to understand here is that if you haven't already started this process, uh, then as my dad used to say, you're in a world of hurt. Because as you can see by all of the steps that are here, this is not something that is easily or rapidly done, that you have a lot of things that need to be considered. Identifying all of the system components and data flows uh, for a large organization is a daunting task. Identifying the business and technical needs, uh, why are there, what's, under what circumstances do you even have a, uh, a need to be using the older protocol, uh, identifying where the older, older protocol is being used so that it can be rem remedied, Disabling any instances of the vulnerable protocol that do not have a supporting business or technical need. Identifying technologies uh, that can be used to replace vulnerable protocols. And documenting secure configurations that need to be implemented in those circumstances. It's also important to document the mitigating project, the mitigation project plan, outlining the steps and timeframes for updates so that you have a method for <clears throat> indicating the milestones that you're meeting and making sure that you're not leaving anything out. Uh, as with any technical project, there's the possibility that making changes, if they're not made in a very orderly and careful fashion, could actually introduce additional vulnerabilities. So a great deal of care needs to be taken in that regard. You should implement risk reduction controls to help reduce susceptibility to known exploits until the vulnerable protocols are removed from the environment. So as indicated before in your risk mitigation and migration plan, uh, those steps are something to be used in the interim while you're making sure that you have the conversion done to the less vulnerable protocol. Um, it's important to recognize that those things should not remain in, uh, in place uh, once you have the uh, mitigated control, once you actually have migrated to the proper uh, TLS 1.2. Also need to update system configuration and standards as migrations to new protocols are completed. Uh, you will have a change control process that will be in place, and you need to make sure that any new uh, applications or processes that, that uh, are implemented fall in line with the upgraded protocols that you have. The Council has also provided very specific guidance on interim risk mitigation approaches, <clears throat> including mitigation recommendations and alternative options for strong cryptographic protocols. 
We've also developed FAQs and tips for small merchant environments, and all of these are available on our on our website. Um, in particular, draw your attention to the mitigating from SL, SSL to, to early TLS document uh, that is shown here on this slide. Uh, this contains a great deal of, of technical information and additional references that we feel would be valuable to you as you complete your mitigation strategy and finalize your transition to the uh, TLS 1.2. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Troy to provide uh, information on key takeaways and to wrap us up. Thank you. Troy? Thank you, Ralph, and appreciate the time, Emma. So for key takeaways, one thing that we want to emphasize is migration date is still going to be June 30th of this year. Uh, that date is not changing. As we've noted and walked through today, there are some serious vulnerabilities in SSL and early TLS that do put organizations at risk of being compromised. And we know that as vulnerabilities are discovered over time, those exploits become more sophisticated. They become less noticeable or detectable. And we want to be moving away now from this older technology. There are no fixes or patches that can adequately uh, repair the SSL or TLS. We talked about that in the um, protocol vulnerabilities earlier. And it's a critically important that organizations do upgrade to a secure alternative as soon as possible, uh, both at the network layer and, and at uh, a data protection layer as well. And to disable any fallback that might be to SSL or TLS 1.1 or earlier versions of TLS. Ralph went through this um, a little bit, but it's important for us to emphasize here today. There is plenty of material at the PCI Council's website that we hope people download. It's, it's free to access. These are the information supplement for migrating SSL and early TLS. It's a short document, relatively speaking, for PCI uh, material. And we hope people look at that and specifically look at, at the migration strategies and, and the compensated controls that, that do exist. And understand where within your organization you might be using this older protocol. We also have a resource guide. Uh, it's very easy to uh, read and, and comprehensible on moving away from this protocol. And then as Ralph just mentioned, we have the frequently asked questions as well as opportunity throughout the year to uh, contact the PCI Council and uh, get more information from us regarding this security issue. With that, I thank everyone for your attention to this webinar, and we hope to hear from you at one of our upcoming community meetings. Thank you.